One year ago, the Migrant Protection Protocols were enacted, and the program allows for certain individuals entering the U.S. from Mexico to be returned to Mexico for the duration of their immigration proceedings. Joining me now to speak about this program, how many people have been impacted, is the Acting Deputy Secretary Ken Cuccinelli. Uh, acting Deputy Secretary, thank you for joining me, sir. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Good Absolutely. to be with you. So I want to go over maybe some, if you can lay out the success of the program known as Remain in Mexico. How, what have the number right. of, how big of a departure have we seen in the number of arrivals at the southern border and the number of people trying to claim asylum here? Well, of course, we've processed almost 60,000 people, not quite, in the Remain in Mexico program. Um, tens of thousands of those cases have been completed. Um, and it's hard to measure um, how many may have been deterred from coming to the southern border, but we just had our eighth month in a row of declining um, apprehensions and inadmissible turnaways at the southern border. Eight months in a row ties a modern record. I think you have to go back to 1992 to see that many months at the same time. Now, it isn't just the MPP program that accomplishes that, but the MPP program, the Remain in Mexico program, has been a critical part of deterring people from putting themselves in the hands of the smugglers. Mm -hmm. So uh, we believe it's a, been a, played a, a very important role. Obviously, Mexico's been an outstanding partner with it, and it all began with just one guy last January 29th. And so, sir, uh, what we have seen is some of the criticism that I've seen of this is that it's cruel to make people wait in Mexico, and that ultimately it's cruel to the migrants themselves who are fleeing desperate conditions. How, what is the calculus behind the program? Why do you think deterrence itself is a good thing? I think that's something fundamentally rejected by a lot of Democrats right now. Uh, perhaps so, but um, the fact of the matter is uh, the same people, same judges, the same asylum officers who judge all our other cases dealing with these are coming up with extremely low approval rates. And what that tells us is that people are coming up with the presumption they're going to be released into the United States and not actually have to go through a formal legal process. And, of course, the MPP program is a substitute, if you will, for detention. They're not detained in U.S. facilities. They're allowed to live and work in Mexico. Um, but they have a court date. It's an accelerated date, just like when we have someone detained in the United States. And a lot of uh, those folks are realizing, gosh, you know, since I don't have a case, uh, I'm not going to do very well here. Some of them go home. Some of them carry their cases throughout. But as I told you, the very same people who are judging other cases across our system with much higher approval rates are coming in with very low approval rates here. And because mm -hmm. the knowledge of that has spread throughout uh, Central America, that's where the deterrence arises. So we right. deter people from coming and making what amounts to false claims um, for asylum. And I also wanted to ask you, sir, there's been a big kerfuffle around the public charge rule that finally came into effect. I know you've had some dealings with this. What is it about public yes. charge in particular? that you? Because the criticism of it is that you're basically demonizing or making it difficult for people to gain citizenship if they don't have the same economic means. What's the administration justification for this? Because they claim that it's racialized. Well, of course, they claim almost everything is. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's, that's lost any, any element of sting or truth to it for sure. But this is a 140-year-old um, policy of the United States. The law we're implementing was unanimously passed by the Senate in 1996. I mean, people like Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi voted for this law. So um, that's what we're implementing, is that version of the law. And all it requires is that people demonstrate their ability through a variety of means um, that they can stand on their own two feet. They'll be self-sufficient. And self-sufficiency, of course, is virtually a permanent core value of the United States of America before it was even a country. Mm -hmm. So I've actually seen pledges from some Democratic candidates actually immediately rescind that law. What would the effect on that be in terms of, in terms of encouraging certain types of immigrants to come to the United States and draw benefits? Well, it, it is an interesting concept. The people running to be president who say, I will rescind a law. Well, the president swears an oath to execute the laws. This law is on the books. And um, <clears throat> and so it's their obligation to do that. As, and President Trump takes that obligation very seriously. 
Mm -hmm. And last question for you, sir. I saw that the Department of Homeland Security is not going to be offering travel benefits to those from New York State. Maybe just explain some more of that justification. And I believe it has to do with their status sure. as a sanctuary. So they passed, a, implemented what they call a green light law, which bars Department of Motor Vehicle information to the Department of Homeland Security. This is very basic law enforcement information um, to match your driver's license to your identity, to identify that the vehicle you're in is one you own. This is when you, say, pull someone over for something as simple as speeding away from a border crossing. Um, and uh, it's a like I said, a very basic public safety element. The other thing, by the way, is up-to-date fugitive and warrant and criminal information. So um, denying that to the Department of Homeland Security bill intentionally builds back into the system uh, the kind of breach in information sharing that we all recognized was one of the causes of 9-11 itself. So it's a bit ironic that New York has intentionally gone about doing this and putting its own citizens and our law enforcement officers at risk in the way mm. they have. So we, uh, the secretary signed a letter to New York yesterday informing them that they would no longer be able to exercise the privilege of our some of our trusted traveler programs um, because we check those up against their DMV databases. Uh, by the end of 2020, uh, that'll, es that'll affect over 200,000 New Yorkers. So they'll still be able to travel with their passports. They'll still be able to travel and do other things, but they will not get the benefit of the convenience of participating in a variety of our trusted traveler programs. Mm. Um, right now, uh, I, I should say excluded from that is pre-check, but included are things like Nexus, uh, Sentry, uh, fast, which is a commercial version for trucking, um, and um, and there, there's one other that I'm not remembering at the moment that's sure. actually pretty sizable. Well, so, but but yeah. that's going to affect tens of thousands of New Yorkers. Well, it uh, seems sensible to me. Well, thank you so much for joining us, sir. We really appreciate it. Good to be with you. Absolutely. We'll have more rising for you right after this. <laughs>